welcome to all of you at the session uh, which is on the research practitioner gap. My name is Miriam Ross, I'm from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, let me present who is um, on the stage uh, here. Uh, next to me, uh, Muriel Sorogosti, if I pronounce it well. She is scientific manager of the large scale biosphere atmosphere experiment in Brazilian Amazonia, which is, suggests that she is a scientist, and she certainly is, but she has a very rich experience as a policymaker <coughs> and as a campaigner as well. Welcome, Muriel. Uh, next to Muriel is Mr. Daniel Gad, who is the owner and the manager of a leading vegetable production and exporting uh, farm in Ethiopia. Then we have Jane uh, Feehan, natural resource specialist at the European Investment Bank, representing the financial sector. David Cooper, who is the science director at the uh, Conventional Biological Diversity Secretariat. And we have already seen her, um, Ms. Uh, Victoria Tauli Corpus, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People. And finally, we have Terry Sunderland, Principal Scientist at C4, um, who is going to present uh, the systematic mapping of landscape approaches uh, that C4 has been undertaking um, lately. Um, and what you will make clear is that landscape approach, although there is a wide diversity of terminology on it, um, as an integrated and negotiated approach on land use and trade-offs um, is well elaborated in, in scientific literature, <coughs> but if you look for cases how it is being implemented in practice, um, yeah, there's still a way to go. And I invite Terry Sutherland to the floor to explain um, well, how they worked on it and what they have found so far. Thank you. Um, could you put the presentation up, please? Thank you. Um, in the plenary yesterday, Peter Holmgren, uh, the Director General of CIFA, alluded to the study that we were doing related to uh, uh, landscape approaches. Um, and we're undertaking a systematic review that I'm going to present this morning. Um, or verging into this afternoon. Um, it's a review that's been undertaken in the last few months and really grew out of some of the discourse of the Warsaw Global Landscapes Forum. People were asking, well, what is a landscape approach? What does it mean on the ground? What is the definition of a landscape approach? So this is really an attempt with funding from uh, the UK's uh, Department for International Development to try and put some meat on the bones of that, that uh, discourse uh, and to try and understand the conditionalities under which the landscape approach is implemented and, and where it's not. I hope this works, which it doesn't seem to be doing. Now, there we go. So uh, we have an issue of terminology, and our partners, uh, Eco Agriculture, uh, in, a, in a review a couple of years ago, uh, identified that there are actually 78 different terms related to the landscape approach. Um, and because of that, there re remains really no single definition to what the landscape approach is. And every time we publish something on the landscape approach, the first thing that we get back is, can you define it? Can you tell us what it really is so we can, we can really understand it? And I think it's, a human, it's part of human nature in terms of understanding and compartmentalizing something. Um, but the reason that the definitions have proved so elusive is primarily because landscape approaches are not a silver bullet and one size does not fit all. And I'll touch on, on that a little bit more uh, later on in the, in the presentation. So just some examples of the current terminology. All of you will be familiar with these terms. Anybody who works in research, development, uh, or any other sector will, will understand all of these uh, fairly uh, comprehensively. But this is a very good example of the challenges that we're facing, the, the plethora of, of terms and terminology, and, and creates uh, considerable confusion in many uh, instances. So we attempted to systematically review the literature, and there's a very big difference between a systematic review and a normal literature review. Systematic review is very much based on rigor um, and a very strict methodology in how you, you, you uh, review the literature. Um, we follow preset guidelines. They are living reviews. They're not um, a review you stop and then uh, uh, um, the, the, the literature contains your, your review. 
they are also excluding, exclusive of bias. So it's very difficult to be biased in the types of systematic reviews that, that we, uh, we undertake. They can be updated, which means, as, as I said uh, earlier, they, they, are, they remain live, they, they're, they're active reviews, um, and includes a dissemination component beyond just um, the, the essential review that's published in the peer-reviewed literature. And again, I'll talk about that um, in subsequent slides. So our systematic map, uh, which began really in about uh, March, April of this year, was focused primarily on two main questions. Um, what is the landscape approach and how has it evolved into current discourse and practice? And how and where is it actually being implemented? And there are three key objectives related to that. Uh, one is to map and, and understand the, the uh, landscape approach theory and how it's developed over time. Review and synthesize the current terminology. As I mentioned earlier, we're, we're faced, faced with a plethora of, of terminologies and concepts related to the landscape approach. And also to look at where these integrated approaches are actually being implemented and under what conditions and, and how and why. Um, so our basic methods, uh, we undertook extensive internal consultations, much of which emerged from the Warsaw GLF last year. Um, discussions related around what is the landscape approach led us at C4 to, to think about that more, about how we can address that for, for subsequent events such as these. And you know, along that continuum of understanding, you know, trying to address essentially the, the definitional approaches, but also the implementation approaches uh, that we refer to. We undertook a number of consultations externally. We had two large workshops, one at the Eco-Agriculture uh, meeting in Kenya in Nairobi in June, and a subsequent one at the Association for Tropical Biology and Conservation meeting uh, in Australia. And these consultations really helped us define our research terms, but also helped us think about our research questions. So the research questions I showed in the uh, t slide, uh, slide two previously uh, were really at the, at the end of a long consultation process. And it's amazing how people like to get into the nitty gritty, the minutiae of those types of questions. Um, we developed uh, a series of inclusion and exclusion criteria for studies, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, and we currently have a protocol related to the systematic map in press in the journal Environmental Evidence. So you can see here uh, we have um, a whole bunch of search terms that were put into, this is a very, very small sample of the, the search terms we used, put into specialist databases such as Scopus and, and others. Um, and these basically provided the, the, the uh, initial um, re references and publications that we used for that for our systematic map. This thing is very elusive. There we go. The one thing I want to touch on here is related to the case studies. Um, the key thing is listed here in red, that we were looking for case studies that essentially were looking at integrating two land uses. Now most projects, initiatives, um, whatever, tend to have a primary land use. And here we were looking for those that were integrating at least two. Um, and also integrating at least two institutional uh, and sectorial stakeholders. And that's very important when we're talking about the integrated landscape approach. So um, I have to say that, initial, as I said um, to our panel when we were sitting prior to this uh, uh, coming to the room, the search terms initially that um, were put into Scopus and the other databases that we were talking about generated 271,000 initial references. Now, of course, that's completely unworkable. Now, of course, the, that's because the, the term landscape itself encompasses a whole broad uh, series of fields, including philosophy, including art. So we then spent about a month trying to um, basically pare down our search terms into, into those that would be more relevant to ourselves uh, in the natural resource sector. We got down to about 13,000 uh, publications where the titles were screened. We then screened um, on over a thousand abstracts. We read uh, full papers of nearly 400 full papers. But at the end, we got, only got down to 47 uh, papers, which included uh, real case studies of landscape approaches in practice. So some of the uh, results, preliminary results. Here we have here, uh, we've just touched on those, the 13,000. Um, abstracts or titles that were screened down to the abstracts and the papers that were read. But across the uh, geographical um, continuum we had here um, a heavy emphasis on Central Africa, um, South Asia, um, and less so in, in less cases in, in Asia and, and, and North America. 
One of the, the main criterion uh, we had to exclude was we had to focus on the English literature uh, for now, and so there is probably a, a heavy bias here uh, geographically because of that. And subsequent finding also, which I find some of it quite interesting. Um, the majority of our case studies started with a single entry focus, a single uh, objective focus. And not surprisingly, and we all do this, um, most of the cases reported positive outcomes only. There were very few examples of you know, lessons learned through negative uh, interactions or, or other problems. Um, and also, interestingly, there's a real dearth of monitoring and evaluation at any of these landscape scale projects. Um, and the literature is, is somewhat silent on the long-term performance of landscapes um, at the, uh, using landscape approaches. And yet, 37% of the papers specifically acknowledge the need for a landscape approach. And let me just move to the graph here. Um, I was somewhat surprised, but also uh, glad to see that forestry projects um, and livelihoods projects, probably integrated projects, um, were, were more um, common in the, in the literature related to landscape approaches. But when we look down here, agriculture and biodiversity conservation seem to be, uh, probably intuitively, uh, in terms of our understanding, seem to be simple sectoral projects and don't, don't tend to embrace other land uses or other stakeholders, which is, which is also a very interesting out outcome of the initial findings. This is a very elusive uh, switcher. There we go. So despite the wealth of information in the landscapes, as I mentioned, we, we got down to 13,000 uh, um, titles, papers, references, whatever we like to call them, um, that refer to landscape approaches uh, from a conceptual, from a framework perspective. Um, there are really very few case studies in the, in the peer-reviewed literature. And we suspect that it doesn't mean they're not, they're not out there. And intuitively, we know that there are landscape approach projects um, being undertaken uh, throughout many areas of the tropics. And in fact, I, uh, with a team of, of, uh, of colleagues, published a book related to um, an evaluation of conservation projects in the lower Mekong, which looked at uh, a whole series of, of projects focused on protected areas, but the wider landscape itself. They didn't make it into our final cut because they didn't refer to themselves as landscape approaches. Um, and so we, we think that the, it's the lack of reporting in the literature that seems to be the main problem. So our next stage is to incorporate the grey literature, so project literature, um, the types of literature that obviously is not going to be in the peer-reviewed um, searching engines that we, we've been focusing on. And I suspect that that grey literature will provide some of the bridge between the academic literature and what's actually happening on the ground. And that's the next stage in our, in our systematic review. Um, as a final product, we wanted to put together an interactive map of, of landscape approaches, where they're happening, um, what types of projects they are. And this is a, a, a screenshot of the initial map of our 47 case studies. And here we, we basically uh, tend to map each of the projects. We, uh, we're going to highlight what they're actually focusing on, um, who's funding them when they, when they are uh, active. Um, and we hope to actually generate and build this map and make it available online so that um, people can contribute to this map um, with their own projects, with their own uh, project information to build up a, 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 a freely available database of these types of landscape approach. Um, I have to say a special thanks to the researchers who've led this work, James Reed, Liz Deeking, and Josh Van Vianen, who have read thousands and thousands and thousands of titles, abstracts, and papers, uh, without which we wouldn't have this systematic review. And I'd like to very much thank you, all of you, for, for coming and, being able, and us at C4 being able to share this work with you. And I look forward to the comments and discussion from the panel. Thank you. Thank you, very. Uh, before I give the opportunity to the audience uh, to ask some questions for clarification only, I just want to check, is there internet in the room? Yes? Okay, then I would like to invite you to go to uh, landscapes.org uh, opinion-compass, where you can position yourself um, in, in the compass with respect to your opinion as how far we are and how ready we are uh, to implement landscape approaches in practice. And you can choose from four statements. Um, one is the concept is well defined, uh, meaning, well, we know the principles, we know the conditions, um, so we're ready for implementation in policy and practice. So that's one statement. Uh, the next one uh, on the top, can we project that on the screen? You have it on your devices? 
Anyone? If there's internet, there, it should be projectable. Okay. The second um, statement um, is, well, it, what about conceptualization? It is already it being, is. okay, there it is. It is already being applied in practice. And I remember a presentation of a um, Peruvian farmer yesterday uh, at the Tropenbos booth mm -hmm. who said, who really made it clear that what landscape is, is the product of what farmers do, are doing. So you could argue and opt for the statement, a landscape approach is being applied in practice. Um, you can be more cautious and say, well, we need more uh, research um, before we are going to implement this. And the final one is where uh, you see uh, Terry's picture. Um, is, okay, the concept is fine but there is still a gap uh, between theory and practice. Um, as we go, you will see the needle moving, representing a majority opinion. Um, and we would like to uh, consider at the end of this session whether your opinion has changed or whether you would like to opt for another statement and see what that does to the majority uh, opinion. Um, now, I promised you to give you the opportunity for a few questions of clarification um, following uh, Terry's presentation. Are there any? It, not for discussion yet. You will have an opportunity later. None? Yes, please. Is there a mic? Hello, I'm just wondering about where you would position geographic literature in this because most geographers think landscape and all the historical literature and landscape kind of endeavors would be under geography perhaps. We, the, the term geography was, was in, in the search term. It was one of the ones that was discussed about whether it should be removed or not, but geography and, and everything related to the geographical sector was included still in the research terms. Okay, thank you. Any other question for clarification? Yes, please. Um, yeah, in the same sense of the lady, um, the term territory, because we use very much the term of territory that will include also this um, the sector cross approach. Have you also included it? And how do you uh, work with this term regarding the landscape approach? And again, territory was another term that was discussed about the, to keep in because it tends not to be a, an anglophone uh, term, more um, uh, in French or Spanish. S but it did it did remain in the initial search terms. And the protocol, when published, it will be available online. We'll have supplementary material uh, providing all of the search terms that we used, um, and you can you can see. We'd hope to have that published online in anticipation of this meeting, but you know, journal editors. Um, so essentially, that, that, that term was included as well. Any other question? Also, for clarification only? None? Okay, then I will go to Muriel. Uh, Muriel, as a former policymaker, plus researcher, plus campaigner, um, how important do you think our landscape approaches in achieving um, development goals such as food security, uh, and particularly in the context of a rapidly growing economy like uh, Brazil. What are the challenges? Uh, what is the practice? Okay. Um, I want to start by saying that um, in Brazil we have a lot of policy experience on the um, landscape approach that we call the participatory uh, regional uh, development, sustainable development uh, planning. Uh, much more, I think, than uh, papers written about it. Um, we, we had, uh, if we look at the landscape approach or the regional planning as a method, uh, to achieve uh, a better, uh, better policies to improve the life of people and to uh, preserve uh, nature and also use the, 
the natural resources, uh, we can say that we are using this already in policies and is not a new concept. Uh, we al already have, uh, for more than 50 years, a National Council for um, Environment. Uh, we have a National Council for uh, Water Resources uh, that uh, had uh, in their um, composition all the stakeholders that are using environment, meaning also the private sector, the states, the municipalities, local governments, uh, NGOs, uh, farmers, uh, and uh, big farmers, small farmers, and different groups, even firemen. And, um, but uh, we also have the started for the last 10, 15 years, to have watershed uh, committees to discuss the water uh, uses, the different water uses in the watersheds. And these are uh, well-established um, forums where you have the discussion on how to use land or natural resources. Uh, we more recently we start uh, some um, very interesting um, territorial approach on planning policies like the citizenship territories that are uh, led by the um, agrarian development ministry um, and includes uh, like 19 different ministries and they had local groups discussing how to do things and what are the priorities for the territories. Uh, the problem is that with this, you, you have a, a confrontation with the legal system that is well established, that we, you, we have the federative union, then we have the state, then we have the municipalities. And when you look at landscape, these uh, practical divisions uh, have no meaning. Uh, it doesn't mean because you, you have a border that is decided uh, for a, a practical purpose or uh, because of uh, different countries that nature will follow this rule nature doesn't follow these kind of rules. So when you try to put in place landscape uh, management and uh, long-term planning, you shock with this kind of uh, practicalities that you need to change. We, we have also a very huge uh, program around the BR-163 uh, is a road that crossed the Amazon from the south to the, to the Amazon River. Uh, and it's 19% uh, percent of the Amazon, of the Brazilian Amazon. It's a huge region that had a very, very interesting landscape approach uh, to decide the priorities for uh, sustainable development. Where do we... Uh, which are the main problems we have? The main problems are uh, inequality in information and in capacity, the financial capacity uh, to mobilize the different stakeholders. Some stakeholders ju just take their private plane and arrive in a place for a meeting. Others have to take a canoe for three days uh, pedaling and uh, arriving in a city and take another bus and don't have the money to do it. Uh, they don't have um, the capacity of talking to each other and have a common view on the group, of the group. And um, there is a di also a disruption in the implementation of priorities, as government has short-term view. They look for the next election. 
so we need more stability in the forums that we are establishing and the more long-term commitment of all the stakeholders to ensure that the policy will go for more than only a mandate. And um, we also need, uh, we, we have a problem of who represents who. Uh, it's an eternal problem, but we don't have to be stopped by this. I think we, we have, uh, it's very interesting that we have very practical examples. We have very few scientific articles uh, written about these examples. Uh, and we have very few um, long-term monitoring and evaluation on how does this work and what do we need to do to support this absolutely interesting and very resultful experiences. I, I can talk all day long on this, so just ah. shut me. Okay, but I, I'm Thank sure you. you're... you're yeah. Uh, input provides um, oh, further input. Ju just one word on food security, sure. very short one. Uh, I think that um, what we face, especially in the Amazon, is not a problem of uh, food uh, security uh, versus uh, the forest or versus other uses of the land. Uh, what we face is a, a, a chalk between commodities and food security. I can elaborate more, but I think it's... Two sentences to, two, to explain. Two sentences. Um, what is deforesting the Amazon is pasture and uh, commodities like soybean. Uh, and uh, they have a very good trick uh, to pass through uh, Unilever uh, criteria. Uh, first of all, uh, the pasture arrive and then soya arrive in the pasture lands that are already degraded. So they are saving the land and not deforesting. So, okay, thank uh, you very much. Um, well, that brings us to the, it's nice that you yeah, ended up yeah. with food security because that brings us to the farmer's perspective and also the issue, well, about the, the the difficulty of getting farmers on the, on the table because they need a lot of traveling time sometimes um, uh, to get on the negotiation table. Um, Mr. Grad, what, what do you think from your position as a farmer? Um, yeah, what are the hindrances and the possibilities for farmers to, to engage in landscape approaches? And you told me in the break that you came here as a, a, a being a bit skeptical. Um, but that your opinion is changing. So, uh, please, from your perspective as a farmer, uh, tell us how you see um, the implementation of landscape uh, approaches from a farmer's perspective. All right, thank you. Um, it, it's clear, I think, to, to all who have attended the sessions here that this is not a single solution. It's not a silver bullet. The world farmers... Uh, in, 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 in the history of farming and agriculture have been dealing with a multi-pronged approach to the reality of what we face every day. We have been the custodians and are still custodians of the land, custodians of Mother Earth. There is no farmer today that goes onto his land or her land to go and destroy it in a vicious way, intentionally. There have been farmers, historically, whether they are commercial or individual farmers, who because of many reasons have misused or abused and have not been able to keep up with the changes in the landscape of the farms and the communities and the areas that they live in. If you look at the history of how farmers organized into villages, you will find that farmers have always built landscapes around them for protection, for windbreak, for water conservation, for soil conservation, etc. I belong to a World Farmers Organization. And in meeting with farmers from all over the world who are represented here and are participating in this event from Uganda, to, from Peru, from Uruguay, 
from Brazil, from Ethiopia, from many parts of the world, including Jamaica. One thing that we have a consensus on is that, yes, this is important, but in the schedule of important things that we have to do, the scale of landscape approach is so significant that we cannot do it alone. Farmers till their land. When a farmer takes responsibility for her piece of land and she produces yams or cassava or any other crop, she does it for several reasons. One is survival, to produce food for the immediate family. And the second one is to provide enough food to produce a, a product that can be sold and bring in cash or other commodities in exchange for the farm goods or crops. But at the same time, that farmer is part of a very large community. Thus the commonness of what farmers do. As custodians of the land, landscape approach is part and parcel of every day what a farmer does in a community, but not what a farmer does by herself or himself. In the larger context of the relationship with we, what we're discussing on the role of the research community and the linkage to farmers, what I would tell you is the same thing that we have said to CGIR in Montpellier. We want the research, we need the research, but we want it in a form that is understandable and that is usable. Research has become quite uh, extensive, sometimes complex, but farmers have come together in farmers groups and organizations, and we want real, clear, simple, understandable projects that we can relate directly to crop production. Remember, there are over 500 million farmers who are in subsistence producing 80% of the food that we eat. But potentially, the damage that is occurring in the landscape where we farm is not directly attrib attributable to what we do on an everyday basis. We are still farming. In Ethiopia, 66 million farmers are still farming with an underfed ox and a piece of stick about 15 centimeters long scratching the surface of the soil. These 66 million farmers have been doing this since the 14th century. And we're still doing it. Our level of producing something to replace the horrible hoe, do you know what a hoe is? It's a piece of metal with a stick on the back of it. It's back-breaking work if you ask any West African woman farmer. She will tell you, if there's a replacement for this hoe, we're asking research, what can you do for us? And we're asking the financial services industry and our partners in development and the donor community to please help us put this hoe in the museum so we can get on with producing more from the same land that we have. The land distribution today is, is imbalanced. It's out of balance. The amount of food we are producing in Africa, in Africa, okay, where you can fit most of South America, North, and North America, and Europe into the continent of Africa, less than 7% of the arable land is under production. So where are we today in terms of making a decision about which priority as a farmer do I spend my time on? So I have a role as a member of a farmer community to take care of the overall landscape and environment around me. I have also got a role as an individual farmer to increase my yield, to contribute to food security, and to produce crops that are in direct relationship to the needs of nutrition in my community. This is a double-barreled shotgun that every farmer deals with every day. At the same time, the more we produce, the less we get paid. Because the way the economics of the world and the global community works, you are punished economically for producing more and rewarded for producing less. And having to pay more for inflation and more for control of seed, more for control of fertilizers and inputs that you need to run and operate your farm. 
So with the international organizations and research, as farmers, what we ask is, give us simple, practical guides and assistance that makes the situation we are in today better. A 1% increase in the amount of land that we are using and a 1% increase in the yield of crops by 500 million farmers would be a significant contribution to global food security. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you're mainly talking about what well, landscapes is what we as farmers make of it. Um, now, the way we are discussing landscape approaches in this uh, global landscape forum is also a negotiation approach, negotiating different land uses and trade-offs between conservation and development, food security, climate smart, landscapes, etc. Um, if you look at it from that perspective, um, how do you think we sh what should be done to get farmers on, uh, engaged in this negotiation process and, and what uh, kind of incentives are needed to get them on the negotiation table? I think the judge said it today that we must have a more inclusive approach that brings representatives from the farming community to participate in this negotiation and have legal protection and constraints for the enforcement of these agreements with regard to the implementation of any landscape approach. Secondly, landscape approach, and I'll give you an example, uh, it was a video that was shown during the plenary yesterday or just before the plenary. And I'm, it's a selfish example because I come from Ethiopia, but I know this project. It has taken over almost 36 months to make a huge landscape approach solution for a community that has been historically a community that you used to watch on CNN a few years ago when Bob Geldof and other very good actors and singers got together and sang about food aid. This was the community that was impacted by severe droughts and it's taken three years and is now impacting positively the lives of over three million people. How was that negotiated? It was a government commitment, a donor com commitment, the research com community's commitment, etc. So what you're saying is absolutely true. It is a coalition, it is a negotiated, and it is long term. Because landscape approaches are not silver bullets and one day approaches. Okay, sir. I'm going to continue with a different tool. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I'm yeah, done. Thank you. Um, I will go to um, Jane Feehan then. Um, we Ms. heard uh, Ms. Kakabatsi say uh, saying to, uh, this morning in the plenary, well, we need to restructure finances uh, around yes. landscapes. So my question to you, representing the financial uh, community, is, um, uh, is integrated landscape thinking already a consideration for investments, for instance, uh, in terms of sustainable sourcing? Um, can you elaborate on that, please? Because yeah, landscape approaches as a negotiated approach requires a lot of transaction costs, as we heard, and, and costs a lot of uh, time and money to bring, uh, remote, uh, in particular, re remote actors uh, on the negotiation table. So what, what can the financial sector do? Am I... Am I on? I think yeah. I'm on. Am I on? Yes, thank you. Um, well, um, good morning, everybody. Um, if I may, before answering your question, your first question, um, I just want to start by sincerely thanking the organizers for inviting ourselves from the European Investment Bank to share our point of view with you in this interesting session and to contribute our view of, uh, of this gap uh, from, from the perspective of ourselves as practitioners in the, in the financial arena. Um, uh, in case you're not um, familiar with our organization, um, the European Investment Bank is the European Union's long-term lending bank. We're based in Luxembourg. And we're the largest multilateral financier for climate action. Um, we have a target of 25% of our total business uh, for climate action. We meet and exceed that target. Um, last year, in 2013, we delivered uh, 19 billion euros in financing for climate action oriented projects. And um, forestry and agriculture are important sectors within that, small but important sectors within that. Um, 
Uh, on the forestry side, we're lending about 900 million euros a year to projects throughout the, uh, the forest value chain, both in Europe and outside Europe. Um, and um, it is important to underline um, not just what we do do, but what we do not do, um, because we have an exclusion on financing uh, any activity which contributes to the deforestation or degradation of um, tropical and subtropical natural or high conservation value forests. And that exclusion applies across our portfolio. It is not only in the forest sector. Um, so, um, so much for uh, a, the brief uh, introduction of, of who we are. Coming to your question, Miriam, um, whether integrated landscapes thinking is already a consideration for investments and whether that's part of our lexicon. Um, I would say yes, um, but we don't call it integrated landscapes thinking. We tend to talk more about um, diversification of revenue streams. Um, it was interesting, that the, the uh, consideration that Terry gave in his presentation to this issue of language and how different practitioners tend to use different words to talk about essentially the same things. Um, and this is perhaps one example where um, we would speak about um, the financial robustness and attractiveness of a diversified vehicle with several different revenue streams, whereas a practitioner in another field might speak about the, the landscape's level uh, benefits of having uh, different uh, interlinked activities. So it's, it could be the same thing, but described in a very different way. We see an increasing number of examples of projects which which are developing several landscapes-based revenue streams. For example, forest carbon alongside sustainable commodities and agritourism, for example. And those different sources of income can be mutually reinforcing and they can help to address both deforestation and the drivers of deforestation. But what's the business case? Because that's not really the business case. What's the business case? Why is that commercially attractive? Well, um, we could, I, I could point to four aspects of that which are interesting from a commercial point of view. Um, firstly, it's, uh, it's about reducing financial risk by having different, sometimes counter-cyclical, sources of income which can together build a more financially robust activity. Secondly, it is about securing increasingly vulnerable supply chains. Many companies in uh, the agriculture and forestry sectors are becoming more and more sensitive to um, the vulnerability of their supply chains um, and the risks that that exposes them to. Thirdly, it's about responding to consumer and shareholder demands on taking a long, hard look at actually where are my raw materials coming from and um, where are the problems in that supply chain, how can I improve that? And, and fourthly, briefly, um, it's, it's increasingly about securing market access because certification, uh, for example, um, uh, Forest Stewardship Council, uh, Marine Stewardship Council in the, in the fisheries sector, certification used to be about um, capturing a, a, a premium in, in, in a particular market. But it is moving towards actually um, securing access to particular markets for particular commodities and companies are aware of that and they're sensitive to that. Um, I don't want to say too much about forest carbon because this is something which is being discussed a lot uh, elsewhere uh, um, over the course of this weekend. But just briefly, I mean, the forest carbon revenue stream alone is not enough to attract investors. It's too vulnerable, it's, it can be too volatile, it can be too small. But there's increased willingness alongside that um, um, on the part of the agriculture and forestry companies to really look at their supply chains and ask how can they produce you know, better, uh, produce smarter, produce greener. And, and there are multiple sources of finance linked to that, that, that um, process. Um, and they should all be tapped into, really, uh, to help address deforestation and, and support more sustainable production of key commodities at landscape level. So much for the first question, Miriam. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And, yeah. and then my, my second question is, um, 
Are there any special funds um, at, at a European Investment Bank? If, for instance, yeah. coming out of this uh, uh, conference, uh, there will be yeah. a joint initiative by C4, by, by the uh, experiment uh, or the mm. biosphere atmosphere experiment that Muriel is represented, or the Ethiopian farmers. Um, well, okay, let's sit together and let's implement a landscape approach here or there. Mm. Is there any special fund to bring stakeholders together at, at your bank? Mm. Well, looking at the toolbox that we have and um, the financial tools that we can bring to bear on, on these, these questions and these needs, um, uh, our bread and butter is um, the standalone um, investment loan for a large single project. And that, that kind of approach is really not that useful in this context. Um, it's too blunt, it's too big. But um, equity-based funds, um, another one of, one of our, our, our tools, um, this can be valuable, th these can be very valuable in this context. Um, uh, these funds can be a useful vehicle for um, delivering finance to uh, project or regional level, uh, sharing the risks and returns from those activities, and then aggregating that um, in a manner which can achieve scale and can attract large-scale participation from large banks like ours. Um, and as, as banks like ours get more comfortable with taking equity risk to achieve bigger development impacts, because we are getting more comfortable with that and we're developing ways of doing that, um, uh, and developing tools to, to enable us to do that, so we are able to invest more easily in funds such as these. And we're, see we're really seeing that happening now. Um, I would say that, I mean, it is, compared to the mainstream of what we do, it's still quite small, but it's a growing trend and, and a very interesting one. I think it's relevant in this context. And to make it further grow, what kind of enabling conditions would be needed? Yeah, um, well, um, I think in terms of what, what's holding, holding that back, um, the, the availability of willing capital is not holding this back, I think. Um, I mean, from our perspective, what, what's, what's holding this back is um, the number of robust, sound um, vehicles out there that we can support. Because um, what we can do is contingent on um, uh, good, uh, good promoters coming to us and asking for our, for our finance. We can't go out there and develop the projects ourselves. So our contribution, our com contribution is contingent on... Um, on, on uh, yeah, on, on good good funds, good promoters, um, bringing bringing their, their their funds, their projects to to us. Um, mm. So um, yeah, but but to underline that I I don't think uh, the availability of willing capital is the problem. Mm -hmm. So good promoters. Um, <coughs> any preference for a scale a scale of working? Because a landscape can be anything on any scale, but is there a mm. particular scale that you would prefer working uh, on uh, from a financial perspective? Um, well, well, fortunately, we have we have several different ways of yeah of tackling different scales of activities. But um, I guess to to, uh, to answer your question, a typical equity fund that we would participate in, our participation would usually be. Yeah, you know, you're, you're talking about at least 20 million euros in a single, in, in a single investment. And we, um, uh, our our general rule is that we uh, cannot finance all of the investment costs of a particular project. We can only finance up to 50% of the costs of a particular activity, and that is in order to. Um, um, to uh, maximize our role uh, in providing a signaling effect and catalyzing um, the, the process of bringing in other sources of finance. Um, so um, we're, we're not able to, to, to finance something uh, uh, up to 100%. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you um, Mr. David Cooper, uh, Science Director at the CBD Secretariat. Um, well, you represent the conservation perspective here. Um, what would you say are the incentives for conservationists to practice landscape uh, approaches? Thank you. Well, I'd say basically, um, in many, many cases, it, it's the only way. We have um, competing demands on, on land uh, for food security, um, 
and for, for carbon sequestration now as well as for, for biodiversity uh, conservation. Um, and so we have to negotiate. You have to negotiate um, how land is going to be used and essentially that's, that happens at the spatial scale. So the landscape approach, I think, provides that, that space to negotiate and it provides a framework in which to make the case. So, um, of course, we would make the case for, for conservation, not only conservation, by the way, also sustainable use of, of biodiversity, um, but also the value that that biodiversity would then bring to other users in the landscape. Okay. Uh, and these might be at the, the local scale. So for the farmer perspective, the, the value of pollination, the value of pest control uh, in the landscape, and obviously in more regional scales, supply of water, regulation of the local climate, and at the global scale, um, carbon. So, um, so it, in many cases, it's going to be essential just because there are going to be competing demands on the land and you'll need to negotiate those. Uh, in the Convention on Biological Diversity, our uh, broad framework actually is, the underlying framework for work under the Convention is the ecosystem approach. The first principle of the ecosystem approach is ecosystem management is an issue of societal choice. Um, then, of course, you, it's a question of at what scale or at what range of scales are you then going to exercise that, that choice, but it's essentially uh, involves or should involve a, a, a negotiation among all the stakeholders, the, the pressures on the land. And, of course, the challenge is then linking those multiple scales those multiple demands which are, are only recognized perhaps at different scales and I think that it's the multi-scale aspect that's perhaps one of the bigger the bigger challenges and ultimately why you need to complement um, stakeholder uh, discussion at the local level with with higher level um, uh, a higher level policy framework um, and I think that reflects back to some of the things that were said this morning um, by Justice Benjamin and, and others. So you need some framework, you need some legal or policy framework um, to enable, I think, an effective application of the la landscape approach. Yeah. If you look at more specific um, incentives now, so Red Plus is obviously one. Um, Red Plus operates essentially at the jurisdictional scale, so it operates at the, at the national scale. Um, that's you could say that's even bigger, depending on the size of the country, that's even bigger than, than, than the national scale. Uh, and it's focused predominantly on forests, but we need to look also at other ecosystems. Um, otherwise, we risk protecting the forest, but perhaps losing the savannah. Uh, take the case of Brazil, where there's been a very effective reduction in the rate of deforestation in the Amazon forest of around 80% over the last 10 years but we've seen an increase in the, in the deforestation or the loss of vegetation in the Sahado, in the savannah ecosystems. So you need to, to look at, at all those ecosystems um, to prevent that leakage, and then ultimately also to prevent undue pressures on, on uh, the food production se sector. We, we need to make sure that um, our incentives for Red Plus, our incentives for conserving carbon, do not drive out um, food production, particularly, I would say, uh, small-scale food production. Uh, and incidentally, I think it's, it's these sorts of linkages which mean that we must make sure that in the climate agreement being negotiated in, in COP20 and then next, next year in, in Paris, that we, um, we look um, at land and land use um, very effectively to make sure that uh, carbon-based uh, carbon incentives don't drive out uh, these these other major uh, ecosystem services that the landscape provides. Mm -hmm. And what would you say are the main barriers that conservationists are facing when uh, yeah, developing those multiple objective approaches towards ecosystems, taking account of both environmental services and sustainable land uses? Um, perhaps the first is a, a lack of a coherent uh, coherent policy framework in many countries across different land uses. Um, so many countries, probably most countries, for example, have a forest law, which uh, will say how the forest uh, or lands designated as forest should be, should be managed. Um, but once land is no longer designated as forest, it no longer applies. 
um, and then um, you can end up with, with essentially no rules on uh, how the, the remaining part of the landscape is, um, is managed. So I think that's one thing is that you need a wall-to-wall -wall, um, law or policy framework, if you like, um, to, uh, for how the, the landscape uh, within a particular country um, is, to, is to be managed. Now, there are very important, I think, um, existing tools and frameworks that different countries use, uh, ecologic and economic uh, zoning, ordinamiento territorial, um, various forms of spatial planning that can be important. And they're very useful tools, but they need to be situated within a, um, uh, this broader framework. Um, and then I think the incentive measures obviously need to be aligned with those. I think the second challenge will be an imbalance between the different stakeholders. So, you, you know, the, the power of some very large vested interests, particularly if um, smallholders or indigenous and local communities um, uh, don't have their rights guaranteed. You cannot have a fair negotiation if some people are, or some of those stakeholders are very powerful and others don't have their rights guaranteed. And again, I think some of the things that Judge Benjamin was saying this morning uh, sort of uh, speak to that. Um, and as well as uh, reflecting the rights and, and protecting the rights of indigenous community, incidentally, you know, if you look at the effectiveness of, of conservation in, in many countries, indigenous lands are often, even though they're, they're not necessarily the main purpose of those lands is not conservation, conservation of biodiversity is often much more effective in those lands than even mm. official protected areas. But besides protecting the, the rights of indigenous communities, local farmers and so on, there has to be some representation at the local level of the broader public interest at the national and now I think the global scales as well. Um, that brings back to this issue of this challenge of matching what happens at these, um, at these various scales. You know, if you look at various scenarios for um, how we could simultaneously protect biodiversity, stay within two degrees, and achieve food security, it, it can be done. It can be done uh, with the land um, that, that, we, that we have, uh, but it's not simple. And um, as Daniel said, there's no, there's no silver bullet. You need a combination of, of, of measures, and I think in looking at that combination of measures, you also want to make sure that you look at the compatibility of the individual measures, that you, that, uh, you don't drive out some possibilities um, by just going down one particular, one particular pathway. Okay, I just received a message that we really should stop at 1.15. So I would like to use your second point as a bridge to the last uh, panelist. Um, had the issue of rights and, and the voice of indigenous people, and we heard the uh, impressive speech um, by Canada Maswa Salagar this morning. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to uh, Victoria Tauli uh, Corpus is, well, how do landscape approaches fit in with indigenous worldviews and livelihood practices? Mm -hmm. And, and um, yeah, what are, what's in it for, for indigenous people? Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, I was uh, in the pa opening plenary yesterday and I think I stated uh, strongly that the landscape approach is something that resonates very uh, well with indigenous worldviews and practices in relation to how they can, uh, uh, of course, conserve and sustainably use their lands and waters. And so uh, for us, that's not something that's very strange. But I just, I just wanted to comment a little bit on the presentation of Terry because uh, I'm not surprised that you know there is not there is not that much uh, peer-reviewed material that you can use in your research okay. and I think uh, one of the reasons for that is many of those who really indigenous peoples in particular who practice landscape approach we don't we cannot we do not do this I mean you know we do not have the capacity to do the research and in most cases many of the say some kind of the western scientists who come to our communities they also don't understand very well the the, the whole context of how how uh, land management and water management is, is really done in a more holistic manner so i think uh, that's really one of the big gaps no and that's why uh, there is not such a uh, 
uh, proliferation of materials on that. But the second point I wanted to say was, you know, indigenous peoples have, uh, and their livelihoods, many indigenous peoples are still uh, rotating agriculturists, they are pastoralists, they are hunters and gatherers, you know, and of course they also have other livelihoods like, uh, like handicrafts or art, or, you know, artisanal production, which is very much dependent on the land and the territories where they are based. You know, I, we are, for instance, my organizations prior to I becoming a rapporteur, we have been supporting indigenous women in the Amazon of Peru who very much are doing this, uh, are doing this dyeing of cloth, but they are taking the dyes from the forest, you know, from the fruits of the forest. And in, if those forests are going away, then that kind of livelihood that they're doing will definitely be destroyed. No? So I think the, the things that we need to do in terms of, uh, of really enhancing the possibilities for indigenous peoples to contribute their knowledge and their practices in, in doing an integrated and uh, holistic uh, uh, management and uh, governance over the land's territories and resources is of course to respect the rights, you know, as contained in many international instruments already that have been agreed upon and committed to by states. Uh, the other thing is the, uh, on the issue of traditional knowledge, because many now, you know, there is a recognition that there are multiple uh, knowledge systems, which include, of course, a traditional knowledge or indigenous knowledge systems. And these are equally valid as Western science, but of course the tools that are used to be able to pr uh, present this and really convince the government policymakers that they should support these systems are not there, so the, uh, the, the interface with policy is still very weak. And I think that's one of the things we need to work more around so that we will be able to really convince uh, uh, po uh, you know, uh, policy makers that, that this is a very valuable you know, source of uh, practice and knowledge that needs to be supported more strongly. And if the evidence, the evidence is showing that many of the better protected ecosystems are found in indigenous territories, it's because of that kind of approach that we have been using, you know, and we continue to use and we continue to assert should be supported instead of undermined. So I think my message really for, for especially for the scientific and research community, who is um, of, of which many of you are, is to really, uh, how, do you, how do you really uh, also build your capacities to be able to understand the, the worldviews, the practice of indigenous people, so that the knowledge systems they have which have allowed for this kind of uh, sustainable use and conservation of uh, biodiversity and even ecosystem services, how do you support that? And how do you really also influence your institutions and build the capacity of your own scientists to help uh, project and articulate and get uh, support even from the, the donors, no? To really set up these kinds of uh, centers of, uh, you know, ex of excellence of traditional knowledge so that we will be able to consolidate this knowledge and disseminate it even more widely and encourage others to use it. I'm not just speaking as an indigenous person, I'm also speaking, for instance, for the local uh, communities and the farmers. They do have accumulated knowledge, but, you know, because this is not the one that produces the the profits that's needed by the dominant world, then it gets uh, undermined every time. So the, I think that's really, uh, in the end, it's really the development, economic development model that will determine whether we can really implement the landscape approach or not. Because as of now, the ministries of forestry or agriculture or these ministries which are delivering the economic growth that countries need, this is what is given premium in policy, in programs, in, do in, in, in donor support. And I think a time has come that we need to really uh, practice sustainability and integrate economic, social, environmental uh, costs and uh, uh, components for us to be able to really implement the landscape approach. Thank you very yeah. much. Well, we have to conclude, so unfortunately there is uh, no more time because we started late Sorry, yeah. um, to have to take questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, but I was saying that we don't have time oh, for it. I, I was set to finish okay. and to yeah. wind up. <laughs> so I'm very sorry for that. Um, but yeah, what, what I took from the discussion is that um, 
Implementing a holistic and integrated approach appeals to common sense. It is already being done. It's being done by farmers, it's being done uh, by indigenous people. Uh, the financial sector is involved. Um, there's still challenges, as you said. Uh, um, what about aligning uh, with jurisdictional and administrative um, boundaries with financial limits, etc.? So, as a way of having the audience input, I would like to um, invite you to go to the uh, opinion compass again and see whether the discussion has changed your opinion and your statement, whether you would like to change your position and see what the discussion has done to the majority statement. Can it be projected on the screen? And maybe also the people that uh, have questions or want to discuss, we can go outside yeah, we, we and go have outside lunch and together. Lunch. And, yeah. uh, the, I think the, it's always very important to, to have more inputs and discussions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the we'll afternoon session afterwards. will start at 2.15, so um, the panelists will be available uh, outside. And Terry, uh, yeah, I was sure. uh, um, asking you to wind up the session, actually, and see, well, after having heard all these people, uh, what do you think is the next step for your um, uh, mapping exercise? Oh, I wasn't going to wind up as such. I was going to, if you said it was one uh, fifteen, we have to finish. We still have 12 Ten minutes. minutes. What is it? Yeah, Not to your watch. Sorry, that's <laughs> Her watch is minutes. wrong. Okay, <laughs> sorry for that. So, so okay, I, I'm I mean, glad. I would, <laughs> I would encourage the audience to, to be... Then sure, to be we have 15 minutes. Yeah, mine is up at 1.15. Okay, so um, we take a couple of questions from the audience then for the panelists. Um, I suggest we take three of them and then, uh, yeah, you were the first, definitely. You need to set your watch correctly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> It was the timing, not for the time. Right? Hello, um, I'm Peter Cronkleton from C4. I have a question for Jane. Um, you mentioned that there was no shortage of, of willing capital, but the, the obstacle you saw was the lack of, I think you called it robust, equitable projects. And so my question would be, are you aware of any initiatives to try to build capacity for development projects or policymakers to present those types of projects? And secondly, what are the criteria that you would use to judge the robustness of one of these projects? That's a tough question. Okay, I, I, um, thank you. The question is clear. Sure, yeah. I have another one for you from yeah. Muriel as well. Uh, very briefly, uh, loans don't finance uh, science or participation. How do we do? I'm sorry, I didn't loans. understand Loans yes. doesn't finance science nor participation. How do we do to, to have uh, the landscape approach be financed? Okay. Is there one uh, question from the audience? I'll come back to you. Uh, particularly for Jane. No, no. no then uh, David had one? Yeah. No? Okay, then I should just first Jane to answer the question. Okay. Yes. Um, well, thank you very much for those two questions. Um, firstly, um, um, robust, equitable projects. Actually, here's another example of this issue of language. Um, I said equity, and you heard equitable. Yeah, and, um, but, but to come to your, your, your question on how, um, uh, whether there are capacity building activities which can help to, yeah, help to, to, to build the pipeline of these types of projects. Um, I think the most, the most powerful way of, um, of building that pipeline is by, by, by looking at the leaders in this field and, um, and, 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 uh, and sharing that, that good practice which is being exemplified by, by uh, the small number of leaders in this field. I mean, one fund that we are currently investing in is the Althelia Climate Fund which we view as a very good example um, of um, the type of vehicle that I was trying to des describe. And actually learning from what they're doing and, um, and, um, and the good practice that they are developing, this is perhaps the best form of TA technical assistance that we could hope for. Um, you, you had another part to your question as well, how, um, the criteria that we use to judge. Well, um, any 
uh, request for financing that we have, um, we have a, um, we, we go through an internal due diligence on, on each request, and that internal process needs to cover the technical strengths of the proposal, the, the economic contribution, the social and environmental strengths and weaknesses, um, and um, we need to look at all of these aspects to actually judge um, judge whether, whether this project, whether the, whether the promoter really knows what they're talking about, whether they can really pull it off, whether it's financially robust, because after all, we are lending, um, um, we, ha we have a duty of care with the resources that we are lending out, we need to get that money back. So um, it might be a project which promises the world and looks absolutely great, but if it's financially weak, we've got a big problem right there. Um, so, so in our internal, in our internal due diligence, we need to cover each of those aspects. The bank has um, a, a, a strong policy with regard to the, the social and environmental uh, criteria that all of our projects have to meet, and that policy is, is available on our website. I'd be happy to tell you more about that. Um, so I hope that answers, answers your question. Um, with regard to, your, to the, the, the second question, Muriel, your, your, your statement, loans don't finance science. Actually, the, the EIB and, um, and other, well, certainly, oh, I should just speak for ourselves, um, we do finance research, development and innovation with loans. Um, and we work with universities, we work with research institutes. Um, we, we also finance student loans, actually. So we do have a program of, um, uh, of, of, of loans and other sources of support um, for research, development and innovation. Um, whether and how that's being applied in the sustainable landscape sphere, well, maybe that's something we should look at for the future. And, and the final part of your question, how are there any financial funds to bring stakeholders together um, in, in those negotiation processes? Hmm, goodness. Um, I, I would say that that's perhaps the role of the um, the project developers themselves and not of uh, organizations like ourselves which would finance those activities. I would say that's not, that's not our, our role. We would view it very favorably where we see it happening, but I, I think it's hard for us to, to make that happen. We, we, we do have convening power in the sense that, as I mentioned, um, because we can only fa finance part of the costs of any given activity, we often work together with other financiers um, on a particular project and we cooperate with the other financiers and we, you know, we, sh we, we work together on our due diligence. So in that sense, there's, um, at our level, there's um, um, a lot of cooperation going on, but I don't think that's quite what you were, what you were looking to get at. But there's a lot of, co of, co of that type of cooperation going on Cri from our side. Criteria, you should use criteria to finance projects and participation may be one. Well, for sure, with regards to um, um, a projects, um, how, to what extent they are working on stakeholder consultation, um, are they implementing free prior informed consent where um, indigenous peoples may be affected by a particular project? These things are built into our policy on the, sust on the um, social sustainability of all of our projects. So those components are captured by, our, um, by the bank's policy in this regard. So that would certainly contribute, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, just a small comment by uh, um, Mr. Gad. I need the mic. When I'm loud enough without the mic, but if you give me the mic, I want to be sure uh, everybody gets a chance uh, to hear Translate. what farmers talk about when you raise the issue of, of uh, finance in agriculture. Uh, for those of you who like to go on the internet, I'd su suggest to you to go to the CTA website. We had a four-day revolutionizing agriculture finance session in Nairobi about four months ago. I think it's a very important discussion. The EIB uh, is not the issue th that I'm going to address at, at this point, but I, I have to tell you that as, as, a, as a human being, and a member of this educated, well-to-do community that we are all part of. It is a shame, it is a shame that we are unable to financially figure out that the risk factors in financing agriculture are different from the risk factors of our traditional banking. We put banks in constraints and say, here's money for development, then we call the development community, the developing community, 
civil society when we farmers are profitable businesses. We don't look at the valorization of farmers. Farmers produce over a trillion dollars worth of goods and services, which is not bankable. But on the internet, there are companies who produce zero product, can't feed your children with Facebook, or any other high value stock market business out of San Jose or elsewhere. And yet, for the important things in our lives, we solve air conditioning, electricity, but we can't figure out how to improve the financing of agriculture that we depend on every day. We do not valorize agriculture. We do not build equity in agriculture. Farmers produce more, they get paid less. They have less land every day. They're subject to climate and the changes that make their lives a nightmare. They have to depend on the forest for heating and, and cooking their food and building their homes. We provide none of that. And yet we have every year, feed the future, feed this, that nutrition, this, over $18 billion worth on record if you go to the headlines. And we can't figure it out. That's a shame on us as human beings. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was a strong statement indeed. Um, let us take a last round of questions from the audience. Um, okay, there's one there. there. Yeah, there's one halfway. Thank you. Uh, Evan Notman from uh, USAID. Uh, I'll direct my question, I guess, to, to Terry from C4. Um, but first, I want to say thanks for a, a really great conversation from everybody. Um, but I, I want to bring up a little bit the definitional aspects, which I, I hate to dwell on, but I do think thinking about some of these definitional aspects are, are important for addressing the research gap. I think we've heard some very interesting comments today about how uh, different sectors, different uh, parts of this equation are using different types of definition, whether it's a, an integrated portfolio or in the perspective of RED, thinking about a jurisdictional approach, and then a landscape approach. And in many ways, they are very similar, but there are actually very important differences in terms of the perspectives and approaches in which they're taking. And, I, and I'd like to kind of hear your, your perspective on, on how through uh, research and, and really looking at those differences in terms of definition, you might be able to uh, think about uh, addressing some of the gaps in knowledge across these different sectors. Thank you. Another question? No one? I invite Terry to... Yes, sorry? No, no, I will answer after he... Okay. okay. Um, I can try. Um, I, I, th I think one of the most frustrating things uh, of, of this whole landscape approach thing is, is the silver bullet mentality mm -hmm. that seems to accompany it. I really liked what was said earlier about this is, this is not a new concept. The landscape approach is not new. It's just been given new impetus. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a cognizance of the fact that we can't work in silos. Um, I do a lot of work on f the links between forest and food security, and agriculture and forestry have, have always been uh, um, segregated, uh, both institutionally, politically, financially, and in, in, in any other way. Yet the links between forest and food security are extremely uh, strong. And if you come to our session this afternoon, you'll find out more. Um, but nonetheless, I think that we should be very, very careful about restricting ourselves to definitions. Landscapes are very dynamic. Landscapes are var varying in geographical size, in scope, in what happens in those landscapes. And the long-term commitment to landscapes encompasses that dynamism. And, and I think it's the, the, the dialogue has shifted very, very significantly. I mean, just two or three years ago, an event like this would have been people like Miriam and myself talking to each other about landscapes. But here we have representatives from finance, from farmers groups, from um, uh, policy sector, indigenous organizations. The dialogue is changing and those silos are breaking down. And I think they're breaking down because we're not being constrained by definitions. They're breaking down because people are understanding what it is that this landscape approach represents to them. It may represent something different to another sector or to another individual or to another institution. So. Um, there have been a, a whole bunch of blogs leading up to this uh, um, uh, Global Landscapes Forum and also the, the CG dialogues that happened in New York uh, in September, really urging caution about 
not clearly defining or over-defining the landscape approach and allowing it to be a, a sort of overarching framework under which we work um, and, and sort of start breaking down those silos in that way. By adding definitions, you're creating even more silos in many respects and more compartments, the, the very thing we're trying to, to avoid. That's my opinion anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, we are talking about the landscapes, uh, landscape approach. Uh, and, and we have to link this with what is happening globally in terms of uh, shaping a new development agenda. And the post-2015 development agenda, the governments are going to decide on this September of next year. There will be a big summit which will announce what is, going, what is this going to be. And uh, if we see the sustainable development goals that have been developed so far, it does include all the different landscapes that we are talking about, and waterscapes, seascapes as well. And I think uh, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, framework, if we are going to work very hard on that to be able to make sure that while we are talking about these specific different uh, ecosystems and landscapes or territories, whatever term we use, you know, the fact remains uh, that it's, uh, it's really very much needed at this time that we look at uh, any kind of uh, land use or water use in a very integrated way and define policies on how this can be done. I mean, there is no such thing in the world as a ministry of landscapes. No, and maybe it will never happen. But it's, it's really bringing together all the different ministries or, or the different UN bodies or CGA, IARs to really talk about this and what are the contributions that each of them should give to make this a reality. I think that's, I mean, you know, if we're working within the, where we are right now, that is the challenge for all of us. How do we break out of those silos and really bring this together because that is what is needed now. Nature works that way and, and it's about time that we learn from nature, from how it has sustained itself. Of course, with uh, people who, are, uh, who recognize the value of nature and, and come together and really use this kind of knowledge to be able to really bring out the kind of policies that will make a difference in the world. And this is what we need now. If we are going to go the same track, I I'm, I'm bet you, Maybe in 20 years, we're even worse off than where we are right now. So, so it's like a call that, that, that is needed and that has to be done at present. And all of us are challenged to contribute to this. So the research people are, have a very important role to play, I think, as long as they are not, uh, of course, as, as long as they are given the proper support and the proper orientation and the dialogue with the practitioners the ones who are making this happen is something that needs to be to be ensured, like your participatory research approaches. That's still the one that I think will make the difference. I think this is a very neat summary of, of the debate and, and a take-home message for us to take. Just a final question. Um, is anyone inclined to change the position that uh, he or yeah, she took right, on yeah. the uh, opinion compass after this discussion? Yeah. None? <laughs> then at least I hope uh, you benefit from the take-home uh, message that uh, Victoria has given us. Uh, thank to the panelists, uh, thank for ter uh, to Terry uh, for organizing this panel and presenting, and thanks to the audience uh, for being here and providing inputs. Thank Enjoy you. your lunch. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.